to uh, say something so I can check your mic, please? Ugh. Yeah, that's real good. Okay. We're set. <clears throat> Whatever you're ready, Mark. We want Loma Till. All right. We put that to some use on this ready? trip. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why I rattle when I want. <clears throat> okay, right. Governor, let's take us. Uh, let's take you back to the first part of the trip. What were your general impressions of the natives of the Soviet Union? Well, I think the natives in the Soviet Union are very similar to the people who live over on the Alaska side. They're similar culturally. Uh, their lives are very similar, and their problems are very similar. And I think that uh, we can learn a lot from them. They can learn a lot from us. It struck me that while their standard of living wasn't very good, their standard of living was a little more close to the Europeans than ours is. Did you uh, detect that? or? Well, I, I don't know if I would put it quite that way, but uh, I think that their standard of living uh, probably reflects the harshness of, of the climate uh, in the Arctic regions, uh, as is the case in our Ar Arctic regions. Uh, it's, it was clear to me that the Chukchi uh, and the and Yupiak uh, were, were very close in many, many ways. One of their concerns was the environment, and of course that's a big concern for us here in Alaska. Uh, the Soviets seem to have very little sensitivity to environmental things, and I know that concerns some native leaders. What was your impression of seeing the pollution around the Soviet Union that you saw? Well, uh, the native leaders in the Soviet Union uh, have for many, many years lived very close to the land, so they have a much, uh, a much deeper feeling for it. And, and it was clear that the environmental damage that had taken place there was something that they were very concerned about. Uh, as far as the environmental attitude all around the Soviet Union is concerned, I think they're probably about where we were in the 50s. Uh, environmental consciousness is beginning to seep through at a high level. Uh, I've had several, several remarks from high uh, officials that indicate that they know that they have to clean up their act, specifically uh, burning coal and power plants, uh, dropping bunker fuel into their water, and I think they'll move in the right direction. Now, as, as far as the, the pollution goes, that's sort of a factor of a, of a <clears throat> economy that's still developing. The impression, at least that I had before I came over here, was that the Soviet economy is on the downward slide and about to, you know, fall right into the toilet, but it seems to have a little more strength than that. What was your impression of it? Well, the Soviet economic system uh, is not as efficient as ours, but it has worked in some way for a long, long time. Now they're beginning to change it, and I think that they probably aren't real sure where to go with it. Uh, clearly, the regional decisions are going to be much more important. Uh, they have to respond to their voters and citizens now. And of course, their voters and citizens are not only uh, concerned about their quality of life, in, in an economic sense, but they're also concerned about the environment. Uh, they don't want to breathe dirty air, they don't want to drink uh, uh, infected water, and uh, they, they are going to put pressure on their officials to move in the right directions on these, on these matters. Since the economy is in a period of transition, does that make it difficult to deal with them from a business sense? Oh yes. Uh, it's very difficult to tell uh, what the rules are going to be because they don't know themselves. Uh, bear in mind that this is, uh, this is a culture which basically operated uh, on the premise that central planning was the way that you did things. Uh, now, in all areas that we've visited, it's clear that people realize that you can't really do business that way. Now, where they go from here, they're not sure because they don't have any institutional memory of a market-based system like, for instance, the Chinese do. Uh, so the Soviets are moving uh, with halting steps. They're very enthusiastic about joint ventures with foreign partners, but they aren't real sure what joint venturing means. Uh, that will sort itself out over time, and we, uh, I think, have to be catalysts in that process. But are, isn't that a little difficult in the sense that they're not really, although they want to make some changes in their economy, none of them really sound like they're ready to scrap communism. I mean, they, they don't talk bad about their previous leaders and I think now we're on we're at a new age you know they still embrace communist principles so how much can you really expect them to change well I think that, that the proof will be not in what is said but what is done uh, you can call a system anything but the way that it works is what counts uh, they realize 
uh, that they have to change not only their economic system but also their political system. Uh, they did not make the mistake that China made. China thought they could liberalize their economic policies without e liberalizing their political system and they found out that they couldn't do that uh, with the student riots in Beijing. Uh, the Soviets, to their, their credit, realize that they have to liberalize both systems in order for them to work in the way that uh, is to the best interests of the Soviet citizens. One of the things that many Alaskans were looking forward to sometime in the near future is an air link between Anchorage and Habarovsk or Anchorage and Magadan City. What's the holdup in that? Well, basically the holdup is this. Uh, after the Afghanistan in invasion, uh, we canceled a lot of air routes from the Soviet Union uh, to the United States, particularly those to the West Coast. Now, uh, Alaska Airlines wants to fly from Anchorage to Magadan and Khabarovsk. Uh, the State Department uh, is not willing to give Aeroflot uh, rights to fly to Los Angeles and San Francisco and Seattle in exchange for that route. Now, we can go at that in, in one of two ways. Uh, number one, we can convince Soviet authorities that it is in their best interest to allow this Alaska Airlines flight to go because of the additional revenue that they'll get. And secondly, there may be some possibility of a joint venture arrangement that is satisfactory to, to Alaska Airlines. That's a matter on which I, I can't comment. That's up to Alaska Airlines. But I do think that we ought to try both ways. I think uh, that in time uh, that we will have that route uh, approved. I see problems with, with both ideas, and I'll take one at a time. The problem with trying to convince the State Department to change politics aside is that that doesn't seem like a fair trade to me, Habarovs for Los Angeles and San Francisco. So how do you make the case to the U.S. government? Uh, that was not one of my suggestions. Uh, I don't think we can convince the State Department either. My suggestion was that we convince Airflot that it is in the nation's best interest as well as Airflot's best interest to allow this this flight to come in unilaterally. The reason is that the people that Alaska Airlines would channel into the Soviet Far East from the West Coast would then generate revenue to Aeroflot for other destinations because Khabarovsk is a, is a, is a hub for travel. Uh, you can go from Khabarovsk to everywhere in the Soviet Union. Uh, secondly, the people that get channeled in through this route from the West Coast uh, would also spend a lot of money uh, in the places that they visit. So it's in their best interest to allow this flight, and it's our job to convince them of that. Now, do they understand that? I guess that's the real issue. The Soviets are kind of elemental in their economics. You give us this, and we give you that. They sort of, they don't seem to have a real sensitivity for, look, if you give this to them, in the long run, you're going to benefit yourself. How, how good is that message getting to them? Well, bear in mind that the decisions are not made on a regional level. The regional officials of Aeroflot want this to happen. The problem is in Moscow. Yeah. You better do that again, huh? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, roughly... You want me to just say that again? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Bear in mind that the problem here is not with the Soviet Far East Aeroflot officials. They all want this to happen. The problem is in Moscow. Uh, if it takes a trip to Moscow on my part, then I'll do it. But I want to cement this, this air route in. How about the, the possibilities for some sort of venture where we use the Soviet Arctic shipping fleet to take <clears throat> products such as fish to Europe? How uh, reasonable is that? How likely is that to happen? Well, we'll be discussing that this morning, uh, but that's a proposal that has a lot of merit to it. Uh, the reason is that products from the uh, American West Coast will arrive in Europe approximately 14 days than they, than they would otherwise if they have to ship those products through the Panama Canal. Uh, if the uh, Soviet Far Eastern Shipping Company is willing to keep those sea routes open across the Arctic all year long, it will be a big advantage to shippers uh, who send products to the Soviet Far East uh, uh, and to, uh, to Europe because uh, the products will get there quicker. Now, some people have even spoken of taking lead and zinc from the Red Dog Mine and shipping it over that route. Is that very practical, considering those minerals would essentially compete with Soviet minerals? I don't know what the economics of sending ore across the Arctic uh, during the winter might be. Uh, that's a matter for those companies to work out. They may well find a smelter that's appropriate for their purposes. It depends a great deal on where their markets are uh, for the metals that are refined. 
what do you think has been the greatest accomplishment of this trip? And I mean, aside from, yeah, we made a lot of good friends and a lot of good contacts, what has been the best thing to come out of the trip? We have a special obligation and a special opportunity in the Soviet Far East. Uh, we're the people next door. And I think in the long run, this trip will prove to have been the biggest factor in our uh, ability to be basically the, the agents for everybody on the West Coast for the Soviet Far East. Uh, Jenna Brailsford and John Tihotsky uh, probably know as much about the Soviet Far East as anybody in the United States. Uh, that'll prove to be a very big advantage for us. A lot of citizens in Alaska are beginning to know a lot about the Soviet Far East. We don't have to confine our, our activities to Alaska. We can do business uh, from the West Coast as well. Now, when can you tell people in a reasonable, you know, with some reasonable <coughs> certainty that, look, we're going to see results within a year, within two years, we're going to see an air route in six <coughs> months. What can you tell people concretely about what we're going to get from this? Well, the air route will be a decision that will be made in the next 12 to 18 months. There's no question about that. I think on the economic joint ventures uh, that you have to bear in mind that even with the Japanese, with whom we've had a relationship for well over 30 years. Uh, it takes four to five years to put together uh, a deal. And uh, this is doubly uh, difficult in a place like the Soviet Union, where there's no real understanding of the U.S. economic system on their side, no real understanding of the Soviet economic system uh, on our side. Uh, it will take patience and persistence, but I think that we have an obligation uh, to go forward and press for these things. But clearly you're not going to be around when, when <clears throat> this happens. Are you worried about someone else coming in and screwing it up? Well, I'm going to be around. I just won't be the governor. Uh, I don't think there's any question about the fact that anybody who is elected governor after me uh, will continue with this program. It's too popular with the Alaskan people. I don't think the Alaskan people are going to, to allow any governor to say, well, uh, we're not going to deal with those guys anymore. Uh, we're not going to take advantage of those opportunities that we've created. Give the next governor your best piece of advice about <clears throat> dealing with the Soviets. Be patient, be understanding, uh, and keep going. That's all I need. I just have one last question. What did you think about the Soviet inhumanity Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, hell, I think we ought to make Forget Boy it. Scout camps out of it. <laughs> Forget it. Oh. And, and so uh, from uh, last year, 80% of uh, these enterprises for the production of fish uh, come to the republics. Мы э, занимаемся очень слабо маркетингом. We also dealing uh, about 20,000 uh we got this stuff. 20,000 times a year. Мы Yeah. 
тем, чтобы здесь нахожусь сейчас, помочь предприятиям так провести перестройку, чтобы производство работало лучше, а управление было проще. Все, что хотел вам сказать, спасибо за как вы знаете, что Аляска и Дальний Восток, естественно, были оторваны друг друга на много лет. Now we're greeting each other as long lost brothers. И теперь мы приветствуем друг друга как старые друзья, старые братья. As indeed we are. И это, конечно, и есть. In our enthusiasm, we are forgetting that we have much in each other's history to review. Our relationship to continue to be very strong. И мы это делаем, и я забываю, что наше отношение будет очень сильно и крепко. In the state of Texas, there is a river called the Pecos River. А в Техасе есть речка, которая называется речка Запад от реки Pecos. I believe that is the situation in the Bering Sea in the area that you referred to. Я мне кажется, что это такая ситуация. In previous years, perhaps this would not be such a bad problem. Раньше, раньше до этого времени, может быть, это не было бы такая большая проблема. But as you know, the harvesting technology. Uh, of the fishing nations has increased uh, to such an extent that it poses a grave risk to the stocks of both our nations. Но как вы знаете, технология улова всех стран, которые ловят рыбу, развита до такой степени, что это может могут быть большие ущербы на наш запас. Some some of the people on our side suspect that the figures reported for the catch in the in that Bering Sea area are understated. Некоторые люди с нашей стороны думают, что цифры, сколько именно там ловят эти страны, очень уменьшены в водах, когда мы не смотрели. In any event, I believe it is important because of to establish a management plan not only for the Bering Sea but for all the high seas. И так я считаю, что основать метод управления не только для Бериного моря, но для всех.